Okay, guys, so you know I am like a sucker for mobile games. It's my thing, it relaxes me, I'm just like, mm, I just love, love, love it. So my question for you is, are you already playing mobile games? And if so, why not play and earn with Mist Play? Join the mobile gamers who actually get rewarded for their playtime. Mist Play offers a huge catalog of different mobile games to play from different genres like puzzles, word, strategy, adventure, and just so many more. You can earn points on Mist Play that then can be redeemed for gift cards for companies like Amazon, Walmart, Visa, Xbox, PlayStation, I mean, so many more. Now, personally, I love, love, love playing Critical Strike and also playing Alien Invasion because for me, yes, I do believe in aliens, which that is a conversation for another day, but those are like my go-to games to play. Visit mistplay.com slash 10 to life or go to the link in my description to download Mistplay for free. Get 200 bonus points for signing up today, plus use my code 10 to life 50 when you're inside the app to get an additional 50 free points. And those points are definitely going to help towards redeeming those gift cards. See the description for the full details and get to playing on Mistplay. Hey everybody, welcome back to an all new episode of Dark Chapters with me, Annie Elise. Now the case we are talking about today, like I always tell you, Dark Chapters is where we kind of go more to the deeper, darker true crime cases out there, and that is definitely true of the case we're talking about today. It honestly is one of the most revolting cases I think that I have ever heard, especially because so many of the gory details that were involved happened while these people were still alive, still able to feel everything. I mean, it truly is pretty haunting. Now, I want to just set the stage a little bit because most of us can probably remember a time in our life when we got together to go on a date with somebody. Maybe it was a new date. It was somebody who we were really excited about going out with. And it really is supposed to be a fun and exciting thing for a couple to do. Somebody new who's dating. Maybe they've been dating a few weeks, a few months, but going out on the town, having a night out, right? But imagine meeting up with this person, expecting to have the time of your life, the best night ever, and then all of a sudden having a gun pointed at you, forcing both of you into your car, and then all of a sudden, things go from what might be deemed as a traditional carjacking to a complete nightmare. That is what we're going to be discussing in today's case. So guys, let's jump right in. In 2007, 21-year-old Shannon Christian and 23-year-old Hugh Newsom Jr., who went by Chris for short, lived in Knoxville, Tennessee. Now, even though the pair had only been dating for a couple of months, it would have actually been pretty easy to think that they had been together much longer. They were so, so happy together. And while they didn't say I love you to each other yet, Chris had let his dad know that he did love Shannon. He was falling in love with her. The two of them met through family friends and their relationship took off very quickly. This due to their shared interest in things like sports, their love of nature, just really everything in their life. They loved sharing all of their hobbies together and they loved the same thing. Now, Chris was a Knoxville native and not only was he a native Knoxville resident, but he actually stayed there. And after high school, he ended up pursuing carpentry at the local community college. Now, Shannon, on the other hand, she was in Texas and her family then later moved to Knoxville when she was 12. Shannon had a very bubbly personality and was also pursuing a degree at the University of Tennessee in sociology, and she was planning to graduate at the end of this year. So the couple were just really excited to see where their relationship was going, and they spent as much time as they possibly could together. They were in the butterfly stage, the honeymoon stage. They were just so excited about what the future held. So on January 6th, 2007, Shannon and Chris decided that they were going to go to one of their friend's houses at Jamie's birthday party later that night. Now during the day, the two of them kind of did their own things, running errands, doing their own stuff, but they were going to meet up later that night. Chris actually spent the day at the golf course with a buddy of his, and Shannon was hanging out with her best friend Kara at Kara's apartment. Now, Kara, who was also going to the birthday party, left around 8 p.m. that evening to head to Jamie's house for the party. But Shannon waited back at her apartment for Chris to come and pick her up. Now, Chris, who had spent all day at the golf course, headed back home to take a shower first, get ready for the party, get ready to go pick up Shannon, and then take her to the party. So while he was at home, his parents asked if he wanted to eat dinner with them, but he said that he couldn't because he had to go. He had to go pick up Shannon and figure that they would just eat together after he picked her up. 
So Chris left his parents' house, and he made a detour on the way to pick up his friend Josh, who he had golfed with all day, so that he could give him a ride to the party as well. So Chris first dropped Josh off at Jamie's house at the party before then going back and picking up Shannon, who was only 10 minutes away from the party. So everybody who was at this party knew where Chris was going, right? He was going to pick up Shannon 10 minutes away, and then he would be right back. So when an hour went by, and he and Shannon still weren't at the party, people started to think that maybe the couple had blown it off, which would actually have been pretty out of character for both Chris and Shannon, because they were both known to be good and reliable friends who wouldn't just skip out on a friend's birthday party. But in any event, plans changed, so maybe they decided to do something else, or maybe they got caught up with each other at the apartment. But after their friends tried calling them several times with no luck, people at the party were getting very worried. So after midnight had come and gone, Chris's friend Josh and another friend named Justin Russell decided that they should probably go out and search for them, and this was around 12.30 a.m. So the two guys went right to where they knew Chris was heading, which was Kara's apartment, to pick up Shannon. And when the guys got there, they found Chris's truck. But Shannon's silver 2005 Toyota 4Runner was not there. So it was definitely a little surprising and unusual because during the short time that Shannon and Chris were dating, they always drove Chris's truck. They always were riding in his truck. So why would his truck be there? But Shannon's car wasn't there. But because of this, Josh and Justin kind of got pissed off, figuring that they really did skip out on the party and they just didn't tell anyone. So the two of them left. Now, right around the time that Josh and Justin went to track the couple down, Shannon had actually called her parents and she had let them know that she was with Chris and that they had gotten dinner, they were hanging out, they were watching a movie and that she would be home a little later that night, probably around 3.30 or so. But like any worried mom would, her mom Dina waited around for her daughter to get back to make sure that she was safe. So when Shannon didn't come home at the time that she said she was going to be returning home, Dina called to make sure that everything was okay. Maybe she fell asleep, maybe she couldn't drive, who knows what the reason was. But ultimately, Shannon didn't answer. So Dina was a little concerned, but she figured that Shannon was okay because she was with Chris. And remember, she had just called her a few hours earlier. And she figured that by the time she woke up in the morning, Shannon would be back home safe and sound. But unfortunately, that was not the case. When Dina woke up, she realized that Shannon never actually made it home, and she also never made it to Jamie's birthday party that she had told her about. Shortly after that, one of Shannon's bosses called to ask where she was, since she also never made it in for her work shift. So at this point, her mom, Dina, knew that something was up here. Everything was off, and everything kind of leading up to this call from work did seem a little off, but then her being a no-call, no-show to work was something that she definitely, absolutely would never have done. And to make matters worse, Dina and her father, Gary, also were getting wind of the fact that Chris was also missing. So the families called around to the hospitals in the area in case something tragic had happened, and neither Chris nor Shannon were able to get a hold of them. However, none of the surrounding hospitals had any record of either one of them ever being there. So with no good leads and no one having any clues as to what was going on, the families of Chris and Shannon quickly decided that they needed to get the police involved. But unfortunately, since both Shannon and Chris were adults, the police really said that their hands were tied until 24 hours had passed. So now the families were left with two options, sit around and wait, or take matters into their own hands, which is exactly what they did. Gary and Dina had the idea to get in touch with Shannon's cell phone company to figure out what her last known whereabouts were, where the phone had been pinging. And the company was able to tell them a few helpful things. One being that her voicemail was listened to three times after her last call to her parents that night, at 3 a.m., 1.30 p.m., and 1.37 p.m. Now, in order to listen to the voicemails, though, someone would have needed a password to get into the voicemail system so they weren't able to listen to what those voicemails were. But the biggest thing that the cell phone company told her parents was that her phone last pinged on Cherry Street in Knoxville. Now, Knoxville itself is considered a pretty safe place to live. Like any city, Knoxville does have some crime, but it really depends on what part of the city you're in. But one place that is known for its crime is Cherry Street. So Gary and Shannon's brother Chase took that information and drove around the area in hopes to find some clues and hopefully find Shannon herself. And then, after a long day of searching, they found Shannon's car, 
although it wasn't in the typical condition that Shannon was known to keep it in. It was found on Gilder Avenue, which is less than five minutes from where her phone had last pinged on Cherry Street early Monday morning on January 8th, when it pinged at 1.30 a.m. So after finding this now empty car, the families knew they had enough information to get the police involved finally. So when the Knoxville Police Department got to the scene, they decided to comb through the vehicle for any sort of clues, any sort of evidence. But they quickly realized that they were dealing with something pretty ominous because the car had actually been wiped clean from any fingerprints. Whoever was the last one in this vehicle knew what they were doing. And to confirm their suspicions that someone was in that car who shouldn't have been, they also had found an empty carton of cigarettes that was just sitting in the car, and they were not Shannon's, and they were not Chris's. Shannon's parents also knew that she had brought her overnight bag with her, and also had a couple of donation bags that she was going to drop off, and none of those bags were in the car either. And Shannon's typically pretty clean car was instead pretty dirty. The floors in the back were covered in mud, which was also very strange. And both of her front seats were pushed as far back as they could go, which Shannon never had them in that position. I mean, who does unless you're really tall or you're scooting back for a specific reason? Now, Shannon's pictures, her iPod, her charger, and a teddy bear, all these things that she typically kept in her car were nowhere to be found. But the question was, where are Shannon and Chris? So the police sent an envelope from Shannon's bank that was found in her car so that it could be analyzed in hopes to get fingerprints on it. Now, meanwhile, as all of this is unfolding, both families were completely unaware that the day before all of this, an engineer named John Ford, who was working at a local railroad, found a body while they were passing the railroad tracks close to Cherry Street. And it was very clear that this body had recently been set on fire and the body was actually still smoking. But it wasn't clear who it was because the body was wrapped up in a comforter with a sweatshirt around the head. However, the feet of the body were sticking out and the person didn't have any shoes on. And in fact, their feet were actually pretty muddy. Now, the body was in such bad shape and unrecognizable that the person actually had to be sent off so that they could be identified. So could this have been Shannon? Could it have been Chris? And if it was one of them, where was the other one at? And to make things even more cryptic, a broken dog leash was found right next to the victim, as well as floral strips of fabric. And that leash was going to be very, very telling, which we will get to. So the fingerprints came back to a 25-year-old convicted felon and drug dealer named LaMarcus Davidson. But who was he, and why would his fingerprints come up in Shannon's car? Well, LaMarcus had actually only been out of prison for five months after his five-year sentence for carjacking and aggravated robbery. At the time, he was renting a house in Knoxville, just three minutes away from Cherry Street. The house was really small and didn't even have doors on the inside for the bedrooms, and he had been living in this home with his girlfriend Daphne. But the two of them had actually just broken up a couple of weeks prior on the day after Christmas, and Daphne ended up taking most of the furniture with her. So then LaMarcus bought furniture from a woman named Ethel Freeman, but apparently he didn't actually ever pay her for the furniture yet. Now the thing was, LaMarcus didn't have a job or even a car. He made money by selling drugs, such as cocaine and marijuana, which he also partook in himself. So it was safe to say that LaMarcus's income stream wasn't exactly reliable. So after receiving the fingerprints back, police then put in a search warrant for LaMarcus's home, and they executed the search the day after Shannon's car was found, which was Tuesday, January 9th, and it took place at 1.30 p.m. Now, when they entered the home, it was very, very, very quiet. No one was there and there was hardly any furniture because like I said, Daphne had taken all of the furniture with her. But there was one thing that did stick out and it was something that was in the kitchen. Something rather large was sticking out of the trash can. And inside the trash can was a woman that was attempting to have been concealed by being stuffed inside of five big garbage bags. And tragically, that woman was Shannon. Not only was her lifeless body in this home, but so were a myriad of other things, such as her iPod that had been in her car, pictures, her purse, her camera, and even some of Chris's hats and his driver's license. 
Now, strangely enough, Shannon's photos had been ripped into pieces and burned. So I'm not sure if the killer was trying to cover up who they killed or what, but nonetheless, they did a very poor job because it was clear that it was Shannon in these bags. And it was clear that it was her belongings that were scattered throughout the home. So the police continued gathering evidence and then they ended up removing Shannon from the house so that they could confirm that it was her and so they could complete an autopsy. Now, in the meantime, the autopsy and identification had come back from the person who was found severely burned and covered up on the train tracks. And tragically, it was Chris. Not only that, but one of the homicide detectives on the case actually did know it was Chris shortly after arriving at the scene because his son was friends with him and apparently he recognized his eyes, which were said to be very unique. When he was found, not only was his head wrapped up in that sweatshirt, but a sock was stuffed inside his mouth and a lace from a shoe was wrapped around his neck. After taking the sweatshirt off his face, the medical examiner saw that a blue bandana had been covering his eyes. Chris also didn't have any clothing on from the waist down, and it was clear that whoever did this to him was somehow able to strip Chris down, tie him up, and make him just completely defenseless. Another shoelace was then found, and it was wrapped around his wrists, which were behind his back, and his ankles were tied up with his belt. Now, like I said earlier, he didn't have any shoes on, and his feet were very muddy. So based on the muddy feet and the broken dog leash that was found next to him, the police thought that whoever did this to Chris had actually used the dog leash to lead Chris to where he was found, meaning he was literally treated like an animal. Chris's autopsy also revealed some pretty gruesome and revolting information to say the least. He had been attacked in more ways than one. Not only was there DNA found inside of his body, but there was also extreme rectal damage that had been caused by some type of foreign object. Now, unfortunately, the DNA found was rendered useless because when Chris was burned, the fire basically erased the DNA evidence. In fact, 80% of his body had been burned due to the comforter being soaked with gasoline and then lit on fire. Whoever killed Chris killed him by shooting him three times, once to the back, once to the neck, and then once to the side of his head, which ultimately killed him. And then after he died, they lit his body on fire. Shannon's autopsy also came back, and it painted a picture of the horrific events that she was subjected to, and it was truly an unimaginable nightmare. Her body was found inside the garbage bag, in the fetal position, and like Chris, she had been tied and bound up, but instead of shoelaces, she had been tied up and bound with a curtain and with strips of bedding, which happened to be that same floral fabric that was found next to Chris's body. She was also undressed from her waist down, and what little clothing she did have left on her had a blood stain all over it. A plastic grocery bag was also used to cover her head and it was tied very tight. And when the bag was removed, it was revealed that Shannon's eyes were still open. A medical examiner was able to determine that Shannon had been tortured in a sexual way for hours and by multiple different men, as well as assaulted with a foreign object. She had been brutally attacked and the DNA was found in her mouth, her genitals, and her rectum. And not only that, but whoever did this to Shannon also savagely beat her genitals. Her gums were also torn and her entire body was covered in scratches, bruises, and carpet burns. And get this, just like whoever did this tried to wipe down Shannon's car of DNA evidence and wipe it clean, they also tried to do the same thing to Shannon's body, but in a much more barbaric and horrific way. They poured bleach down her throat and scrubbed her body, including her bloodied and beaten genital area, all while she was still alive. I just can't imagine the final moments for Shannon, and it was clear that whoever was responsible for this completely disregarded her as a human being, I can't imagine that fear and the pain. I, it's unbearable to even think about. But the hours of absolute atrocious sexual trauma that Shannon went through wasn't what killed her. Whoever did this to her stuffed her alive inside that garbage bag. And according to the medical examiner, Shannon died within 10 to 30 minutes after that. Meaning she was not only suffering from the pain of what she had just gone through, 
but she was left to suffocate in a very slow and grisly death. Now, the DNA that was found belonged to none other than Lamarcus, but also DNA found in her mouth was from Lamarcus's half-brother, 24-year-old Latalvis. Latalvis had been convicted of third-degree attempted robbery in 2003, and both of the men's DNA was also found on Shannon's clothing, including her jeans, which were found inside the house. And while the two men tried their absolute hardest to cover up what they had done, they did a horrible job in more ways than one. One example being that the shell casings found at LaMarcus's house matched the two of the bullets that were found that killed Chris. The third bullet was completely destroyed, and it was hard to say for certain that it was from the same gun and that that had been the same gun used in the murder. But police were also able to infer that the foreign objects that were used to harm both Shannon and Chris in a brutal and sexual way were likely a chair leg from one of the many broken pieces of furniture that had been left behind and found at LaMarcus's place. Absolutely disgusting. So police were pleading to the public for any information on this case, and a witness ended up calling in who worked as a waste collector for Waste Connections in Knoxville. He said that while he was on his route around 12.30 a.m. on Sunday, January 7th, he noticed something out of the ordinary at LaMarcus's house. All of the lights were on, and a lot of people also seemed to be there. And not only that, but he noticed a Toyota 4Runner parked out front, the exact car that Shannon drove. Shortly after that, the Toyota then drove by the witness's truck and kind of slowed down for about 20 seconds, just staring at him as if they were trying to intimidate him or something, like a slow drive-by. The witness said that there were four black men inside the car, but he couldn't really make out any details as to who they were or give anything that was super descriptive. Another witness who lived right around the block from LaMarcus came forward as well, and they said that they heard three loud bangs that sounded like gunshots all back to back at 1.45 a.m., and it was that same night, and they said that it sounded like it was coming from the railroad tracks. And of course, as we know, Chris was shot three times at the railroad tracks. So after putting most of the pieces together, police then went on a mission to find LaMarcus and Latalvis so that they could be officially charged and arrested. So on top of putting out a statewide manhunt, they searched the evidence and the information they already had. At LaMarcus's rental home, a rented video had been found, so police were able to track that rented movie to a library in Kentucky, and the renter's name was 24-year-old George Thomas. Now, George was a friend of LaMarcus. They also spoke with LaMarcus's girlfriend, Daphne, who said that on the 7th, he was at his house with George, Latalvis, and Latalvis's 18-year-old girlfriend, Vanessa. But Daphne said that the last time that she saw LaMarcus was when she dropped him off at 34-year-old Eric Boyd's house. So now, at least the police had some extra names, and with these extra names, police were able to kind of hone in a little bit more on this search. So police got in contact with Eric, who said that he believed that LaMarcus was actually hiding out in a vacant house in Knoxville. And sure enough, LaMarcus was there. And not only that, but believe it or not, he was actually wearing Chris's Nike shoes, which were too small for him, yet he managed to somehow squeeze his feet inside of them. And remember, Chris was barefoot, so he literally stole the shoes off of Chris's feet after or before murdering him. He also had a 22 caliber high standard revolver with him. So later on that same day, George, Latalvis, and Vanessa were found in Lebanon, Kentucky, where they all lived. The police found a computer that the men were using to keep tabs on the news updates regarding Shannon and Chris's case. And not only that, but they also found Shannon's things, such as her makeup bag, her overnight bag, key pieces of evidence that had gone missing from her car. So later that day, it was time for the police to interrogate the suspects, and LaMarcus was the first one up, and his story was all over the place. First, he claimed total innocence, acting like he had no idea about anything regarding the case whatsoever, even though he was wearing Chris's shoes. But then he switched up his story, saying that his brother Latalvis and his friend George came to his house either Friday or Saturday around 10 p.m., and that they came to tell him that they had carjacked two people and that the people were still in the car. But LaMarcus, saying that he was being the kind guy that he was, claimed that he didn't want any part of their evil plan. So he went off to smoke a joint, but he said that he did see that there were two people in the back seat who were tied up. He said when he got back after 20 minutes, he found Shannon, who was just pleading with him that she wanted to live. 
So what did LaMarcus do? Well, again, he claims that he never stepped foot in the living room to attack Shannon. But instead, he took advantage of the situation since he didn't have a car of his own. So he took her car and went out to deal drugs. Then, returning, wiping down the vehicle and removing any fingerprints. Just claiming that he used her car as a source to deal, not anything else. So already, LaMarcus was making things difficult by changing up his story and by lying. I mean, they had his DNA evidence all throughout the crime scene. So why he thought that he could talk his way out of this guilt and his involvement is beyond me. Now, during Latalvis's interview, he told police that what happened was that he, his brother, and Eric had all planned to go to an apartment building together for one of them to meet up with some girl. And when they got there, they saw Shannon inside of her car talking to Chris. Latalva said that his brother and Eric carjacked them and demanded that he hop in the car with them and then drive the car to LaMarcus's house. He said he obliged to their demands and took the group back to the house where then LaMarcus instantly took Shannon into one of the bedrooms. And Eric apparently kept Chris in the car and then drove him off somewhere for a while and then returned without Chris at some point in the evening. But Latalva said that all he did was basically stand there like an innocent bystander, claiming he never did anything sexual to Shannon. And apparently Vanessa acted as if she had just been taken hostage for the entire ordeal. So certainly there was absolutely zero loyalty in this friend group, if you can even call it that, because they were all throwing each other under the bus left and right. And then after the arrest, police actually found a journal with the most recent entry being from January 9th, just a couple days after Shannon and Chris went missing. The entry's handwriting matched Vanessa's handwriting. And it said, last night was one of a kind. We stayed with a crackhead that is cool as hell. It snowed a little bit, but it's already melted. Let's talk about adventures. I had one hell of an adventure since I've been in big Tennessee. It's a crazy world these days, but I love the fun adventures and the lessons I've learned. It's going to be a long, interesting year. Um, that journal entry sounds pretty casual to me. It doesn't sound like someone who had been held hostage of any sorts. So even with all the mixed confessions, police had not just one, but five suspects to now charge in all of this. LaMarcus, who looked like he was the ringleader of the group, was charged with 46 counts, including 16 counts of felony murder. Latalvis and George were charged with the same 46 counts as LaMarcus, and Vanessa had a ton of charges against her too, 40 to be exact, all pretty similar to the other guys. And police believed that she was actually the one who kicked in and punched Shannon's genitals and inflicted so much barbaric damage down there. Now, Eric, although he was connected to the crimes, wasn't indicted right away due to none of his DNA being found at either crime scene. And it wasn't until that August when a federal grand jury charged him with being an accessory to Shannon and Chris's carjacking that it ultimately led to what really happened the rest of that night and the gruesome events that unfolded. Now, based on what the police had at that point, they believed that the group did first attempt to just carjack the couple, but then got scared when they saw car headlights in the distance. So at that point, they forced the couple into the car at gunpoint, and then they were bound and they were blindfolded. LaMarcus drove the car back to his house, and Latalvis followed him in another car that was Eric's cousin's car. When they got back to LaMarcus's house, Vanessa was already there, hanging out on the couch playing video games. And according to her, a fight broke out between the five of them due to LaMarcus and George not liking each other. And she said that LaMarcus demanded that George do something big to gain his trust. Which would make sense since LaMarcus seemed to kind of be the ringleader and ran the show. So it's believed that both Shannon and Chris were attacked in the home, and then Chris was taken away while Shannon stayed back. And again, this is all an educated assumption due to the forensic evidence that was recorded. But Chris was beaten for two hours and was also assaulted in a sexual way. Police were unable to figure out whose DNA was inside of Chris, but when police searched Eric's phone, it did have explicit male-on-male -male material on it. So there has been some speculation that it might have been Eric. It appeared that George shot Chris first in the neck and then in the back, all by LaMarcus's demand. And then LaMarcus pressed the gun to Chris's head and shot him. Now, meanwhile, all of this time had gone by, literally hours, and Shannon was being held hostage at the house with Vanessa. And even though Vanessa had every possible opportunity to let Shannon go, she chose not to. And instead, she just sat around 
and assisted while Shannon had been bound to an air mattress in one of the bedrooms. They then took her phone and they called her mom. Remember the phone call that Shannon made to her mother saying she was going to be late? Well, it turns out they had actually coerced Shannon into this phone call, letting her mom know that she was going to be arriving home late, which as we know, Shannon's mom answered that call and she took the call at face value. Who wouldn't? Meanwhile, LaMarcus and George were changing their clothes and then they left the house again after grabbing that comforter and a gas can so that they could burn Chris's body. Throughout the night, Shannon was then assaulted multiple times by LaMarcus and Latalvis. LaMarcus led Shannon to the bathroom twice that night to use the restroom, and by the morning, she was still blindfolded and still very much alive. Then later in the morning, Daphne, the girlfriend or the ex-girlfriend, whatever you want to call her, stopped by the house because LaMarcus apparently wanted her to get the rest of her stuff. She didn't see Shannon, and apparently she had no idea what was going on. But LaMarcus gave Daphne some of Shannon's clothing and also her ring. Now Daphne says, of course, that she had no idea who the items belonged to, so she accepted these gifts that he was giving her. She only stayed for 10 minutes and then she left. Then LaMarcus told her that Latalvis left with his house keys, so she ended up letting him stay over for a few days. But then her mom called her and woke her up one morning warning her about Shannon's body being found in that very house that she had lived in for months with LaMarcus. So Daphne, upon hearing that news, was just sick to her stomach, feeling deep down and kind of a feeling that she had already a little bit that LaMarcus was involved. So she confronted LaMarcus about Shannon's body. But in typical LaMarcus fashion, he dodged the blame and he dumped it all on his brother, begging her to believe him. And Daphne did believe him. So then she dropped him off at his friend Eric's house, which meant that when police had initially asked her about LaMarcus's whereabouts, she lied to them, claiming that she last saw him at his house. Now, either way, police believed that Shannon was suffocated to death somewhere between the afternoon of January 7th and January 8th meaning that she endured hours upon hours, possibly a day or more of sexual torture. But this was far from over because even when we get to the trial, there were still going to be twists that nobody could have anticipated. So Latalvis was the first one to go on trial on August 25th, 2009. When he went on the stand, he claimed that he was basically an innocent person in all of this. And get this, he also says that he was there against his will. She asked me what's going on. I said, I don't know. She asked me where her boyfriend is. I said, I don't know. She asked me because she smoked a cigarette. Her cigarettes and her purse were sitting on the bookshelf behind me. I could see um, a pack of red and white Marlboros uh, on the book stand. I said, I don't see why not. I took a cigarette out, lit it for her, and gave it to her. She asked me, why, why, why were we doing this? I told her, it's not me, I, I don't, it's not me. It's not me, I, I don't have anything to do with this. Matter of fact, we're being held here under, against our will just like you are. The only difference is that you're tied up and we're not. So, she started asking me, she started asking me, could, um, would I convince him to let her go? I said, I'll try. She said, just please, uh, uh, just please. She said, please, can you, can, can you just convince him to let me go? I said, I'll try. And she said, I'll do, I'll do anything. Just please, just let me go. And she, she even offered a little sex. So, and she, I had her give me oral sex. She gave me oral sex. As um, I, as I started to ejaculate, I heard a noise outside, and I heard Vanessa's flushing the toilet. So I got spooked. I jumped up, fixed my clothes. As I ejected, it got on her shirt and some of her pants. I 
I fix my I fix myself, I fix my clothes. I put her back like I found her. And went back into the living room and sat down. The medical examiner went on the stand and testified about her findings on Shannon and Chris. She showed very graphic pictures and went into extensive details. The evidence that was shown to the courtroom was so disturbing that at one point Shannon's friend actually got up and left while the families just continued crying in the courtroom. Even Latalvis couldn't look at these pictures and like a coward, he kept his head down and just kind of was rocking himself and swaying himself back and forth. But after seven days of showing evidence to the jury, Latalvis was found guilty on August 25th, 2009. And Latalvis didn't have much of a reaction when hearing his guilty verdict. He just shook his head. All right, Mr. Foreman, uh, if you would please, if you'd stand, Mr. Cobbins, if you'd stand, face the jury. We, the jury, find the defendant Latalvis Cobbins guilty of facilitation of premeditated first degree murder of Hugh Christopher Newsom. And with regard to uh, count 18, charging uh, Mr. Cobbins with the first degree premeditated murder of Shannon Christian, how does the jury find on that count? We, the jury, find the defendant Latalvis Cobbins guilty of premeditated first degree murder of Shannon Christian. It felt wonderful. We were, we were glad that it turned out the way it did. That's what we wanted to hear. We, we wanted justice for Chris, and I believe that's what we got today. So it makes me happy to know that, of course, it's kind of a bittersweet happiness because it still doesn't bring Chris back. I can't even tell you what all the <clears throat> what all those guilties were, but he raped my daughter, and he's responsible for her murder. And how many times have I told you that he was going down? Well, he just started sliding. Tomorrow's going to be the nail in his coffin. So then the following day, the jury sentenced Latalvis, and they sentenced him to life in prison without parole. We have all tried everything we know. We have seeked the help of a doctor, try to deal with the hate that we live with. The endless thoughts of the pain and the horror that she endured. pictures that have been put into our minds of her last hours I live with the thought that when my son and I, with the help of a bunch of college kids and an old man, found her forerunner, was she still alive in that can? not 200 yards from where I stood. And nothing that anybody says, not a doctor, Not our friends, 
not even what we say to each other makes that hard go away. I will never get to say yes to a young man. I will never get to walk her down the aisle. I will never dance with her at her wedding. I will never get to hold my four grandchildren she wanted to have. I will forever live with the constant <laughs> nagging <laughs> haunting thought <laughs> of my daughter calling to me <laughs> to help her to stop them from hurting her. Never will I stop hearing my daughter's voice. For me to save her. District Attorney's Office did a great job. I want to say that. Yeah, they Before did. We get off of here. They, they did a great job. They got the conviction. It ain't the District Attorney's Office that let us down. No, they showed the proof and the jury let us down. It ain't the, the District Attorney's Office down. that let Shannon down. And it ain't the District Attorney's Office that let, that let Chris down. Who did let them down? The jury. The jury. I mean, yeah, okay, they put him away for life. Okay. That satisfies me in one way. Your kids and your kids and your kids ain't gonna get raped and tortured by Latalvis Cobbins. Mm -hmm. I mean, you okay. go to prison anymore and they can sit there, they can play poker, they can play racquetball, they can do whatever they want. Why, why would they be scared to go back? They it's get, like a they hotel with, food, they just they can't leave those four walls. beautiful landscape. They got a barber shop with a barber pole out there on it. Prison ain't what people think it is. It's a joke. Think about it. The liberal thinking people in this country has turned it into a dead gum girl school. I don't want to go there. The sheriff don't want to go there. You don't want to go there. It ain't a place for normal people, but for that bunch, he just got a lifetime great hotel sentence is what he it just moved down. from the slums he moved up a few notches he's so. still gonna have a life he's gonna get to do whatever he wants to he can have him a little girl boy over here or somebody can have him for a little girl boy they do drugs I ain't stupid I've been to a maximum security prison have you the wardens hands are tied because the people that don't, place. you know, the people that think that we need to take care of our prisoners and they should have more rights and they should have this, well, where were our rights? Where were Shannon and Chris's rights when they did what they did? Do you think then that you guys got justice today? I know all along I've talked to you, you said you want nothing but no, that. No, you did. You got justice. Because your, your child, you, uh, if you have children, will not be hurt by this monster. You got justice. And, and for y'all, I'm glad. For the citizens of this community, I'm glad. But do we get justice? No. no. We never now, get to see our child again. They the get pictures? to go see him if they want to, but we never get to see our did child Did you see again. the pictures? Mm -hmm. You think we got justice? 
maybe putting somebody away for life where they can't come out on the street and do all their gang banging stuff is what is 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 good enough for the community. But they took our daughter. They raped her. They murdered her. They tortured her. They didn't just kill her. They tortured her. Then they killed her. And what then they stuffed her in a trash can and left her to die. What do you think justice is? I guarantee you if it was your child or your child or anybody else's child, you'd want more. We're disappointed in the decision. We, we really wanted the death penalty. I think the jury let us down and they let Chris and Shannon down. Uh, when he goes to prison now, he'll, he'll be getting a home. We've given him a home. So uh, what's the punishment? He's what's that tell everybody else out there that commits the same crime? That they won't get the death penalty? That they'll just get put in prison f for life? I think the jury has let us down. I really do. He has raised his standard of living by at least a factor of 100. Uh, he no longer has to steal to eat. He gets three meal, three hot meals a day that's certified by a nutritionist that they're ample in nutrition. He uh, gets a warm cot to sleep on. He'll be allowed to have a TV in his room. He can have stereo. Uh, he gets free dental care. He gets free health care. I mean, uh, what else could you ask for? There's no deterrent whatsoever in, in that verdict, in that penalty. After Latalvis' trial, three more of the suspects needed to be tried. But first, in what feels like a very therapeutic moment it would have been, the Waste Connection bought LaMarcus's house and tore it down completely, and a memorial for Shannon and Chris went up in its place. So next it was time for LaMarcus's trial, the ringleader. He entered a plea of not guilty, claiming he didn't have anything to do with either of the murders. And at one point, LaMarcus's team was actually insinuating that Shannon had willingly gone to his house to buy drugs, even kind of putting her overall character into question, which was just absolute, complete bullshit. Well, the prosecution team was able to show ample amounts of evidence to prove LaMarcus's massive role in everything. They discussed how when he was found, he was wearing Chris's Nike shoes and how he had that 22 caliber pistol. And not only that, but a forensic expert testified that he found LaMarcus's right thumbprint on Shannon's bank envelope in her car. Also his right palm print on one of the trash bags that Shannon was stuffed into and his left ring finger print on a receipt that Shannon had in her possession. And of course, the smoking gun in all of this was the DNA that was found not only inside of Shannon, but also on her jeans that were found in the house off her body. So needless to say, it wasn't a hard decision for the jury to make, and they found him guilty and unanimously agreed that he should be given capital punishment for his role in everything. With regard to the count charging Mr. Davidson with the first degree felony murder of Hugh Christopher Newsom, that is counts 1, 2, 5, 6, 10, 13, and 14, <coughs> what is the decision of the jury as to what the punishment should be with regard to those counts? The punishment is death. <laughs> The judge on the case sentenced LaMarcus to death by lethal injection, which was a pretty big win for both families when it came to getting justice. Well, the Christians, the Newsoms, and all of Knoxville got justice today. We finally got the justice that the kids deserve, and it makes me feel good. The jury was from Knox County. They are the pillars of our community. We should take our hats off to them, and we should give them a round of applause for... Thank you. So George's trial happened shortly after LaMarcus's ended, and George's defense team tried to argue that there really wasn't enough forensic evidence that connected him to the murder, but they did agree that he was present at the time when it all went down. However, the prosecution team was able to convince the jury with the evidence they did have, and the jury ended up finding George guilty. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole when it came to all four capital convictions. 
Now, let's talk about Vanessa for a second. Originally, Vanessa was placed into protective custody and she was treated as a witness. However, after she admitted more and more each time she was interviewed by the investigators, she then was considered a suspect. So Vanessa went on trial that spring on Monday, May 3rd, 2010. And Vanessa's team claimed that she was held hostage the entire time and that she was forced to do what she did. The prosecution team, though, argued that even if she didn't directly murder Shannon or Chris, she was involved by association, meaning she didn't do anything to stop it, and she helped facilitate it by staying with Shannon while the other guys went off to murder Chris. So while she was granted immunity for her testimony with the carjacking, the state ruled that her immunity wasn't able to be extended to her charges of murder and assault charges. So a week and a half later, the jury found her guilty of the lesser charges, but they found her not guilty of first-degree murder, and she was sentenced to 53 years in prison. Now, as you can imagine, Shannon's parents were not happy with this sentencing because they believe that Vanessa was not the innocent victim that her defense team was making her out to be. You should have gotten the 77. The judge said himself that, that there is no sentence good enough. Um, still amazes me, our system, and its uh, fairness to the criminal. Because she was no victim. She was not held against her will. There were multiple times she could have walked out that door. Whether she helped Shannon and Chris or not, she was no victim. She said in her own words, she was learning, she was having a great time, she was, coming she was having a next. big adventure, she was, she was no big. She didn't say anything today. Did you want to hear from her? <laughs> I could not have said that any better. What she had nothing say? to say. She had nothing to say to me. If she'd have got up, if she'd have got up there, I, I was thinking, if she gets up, I'm walking out. I got nothing. I mean, she wrote in Shannon's forerunner. She had several things of Shannon's in Kentucky with her. Some things that never even got brought back and put into evidence that we identified and saw in pictures. She knew exactly what was going on. She's getting away with murder. Now you probably think that would be it. Everybody got their sentencing and that should just be the end of it. But that was far from the case. See, the sentencing judge on the cases was forced to resign a year after Vanessa's sentencing, this due to a ton of shady things. He admitted to a drug addiction, even saying that he purchased pain pills from convicts, and apparently while he was on the job, a woman also claimed he had asked for sex in exchange for legal favors. So due to his behavior and all of this stuff and him pleading guilty for all of it, the trials that he held the prior two years all came into question. So he was disbarred, and LaMarcus, Latalvis, George, and Vanessa were all granted new trials by Judge John Kerry Blackwood. So John scheduled the retrials for the following year, between June to November of 2012, even setting a $1 million bail for Vanessa since she was the only one of them with the potential for parole someday. However, right before the trials were set to start in May of 2012, Tennessee Supreme Court overturned John's ruling for new trials, stating that just because the original judge might have been impaired during the trials, unless his behavior had some sort of effect on any of the trials, then it basically didn't matter, and therefore it didn't mean going to court again. Now, there was a lot of back and forth with a lot of different judges and people involved, but ultimately, senior judge Walter Kurtz took over the decision-making process, and he denied a retrial for LaMarcus and Latalvis, but he did grant a retrial for Vanessa and George. Vanessa's retrial began on Tuesday, November 13th, 2012. Previous interviews with Vanessa were played back to the jurors and all of the evidence was reviewed once again. And no big surprise, the jury found Vanessa guilty once again on November 20th, 2012. This for the facilitation of aggravated kidnapping, facilitation of assault, and the facilitation of Shannon's murder. Now, while Vanessa's lawyers tried to arrange a 20-year sentence for her, on February 1st, 2013, she was ultimately sentenced to 35 years in prison, minus the time that she had already served in prison. 
Now, George's retrial began on May 13th, 2013, and again, a lot of the same information and evidence was brought up in the trial, but this time around, his sentencing was a little bit different. George was found guilty on all counts. However, he was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 51 years. So now fast forward several years to August 2019, and this is when Eric went on trial. Now this trial was really important, especially to Chris's parents who believed all along that Eric was the one who murdered and assaulted their son. They even were able to work up a deal with George that if he testified against Eric, his sentence could be reduced. And George's testimony against Eric was actually pretty crucial. He said that LaMarcus told him to go off with Eric and Chris, so they drove around and then parked behind a warehouse a couple of blocks away near the train tracks. Eric wanted George to join him, but George refused to go. So Eric got Chris out of the car himself and then walked him away from where George could see. Now at that point, Chris was able to still walk because his ankles weren't bound, just his hands. So then George said he saw three flashes at one point. And then after some time, Eric returned without Chris to the car and didn't say anything about what he did. When they got back to the house, George testified about what Eric did next. Stays over there for a second, and then comes back and jumps back into the SUV. Does he say anything to you when he gets to the SUV? I mean, nothing about what had happened. What does he say? I mean, I can't recall. Probably just some small talk. I mean, I really can't recall. Do you recall if you said anything to him? I didn't say anything to him. What happens when he gets the SUV? Uh, we drive back over to the house. What happens when you get to the house? Uh, we go in and then... Uh, Who gets out first? According to George, Eric left shortly after that. So Chris's parents even went on to personally thank George for his testimony here. Wanted to thank Thomas for having the courage to do what he did. And I don't believe you were ever a violent criminal. We're thankful for Mr. Thomas coming forth and uh, doing this. And uh, I hope that uh, at the end of your sentence, you become a abiding citizen. Chris's dad, Hugh, took the stand and was emotionally talking about the last time that he saw his son, saying, we were forced to embrace a body bag as our farewell to our son. It's demoralizing. It's hurtful. It leaves something in your mind you can never get rid of. We'll never get over the deaths of Chris and Shannon, but with the help of God, we will get through it. So Eric's trial ended on August 13th, 2019, when the jury found him guilty for nearly all of his charges, and he was sentenced to life in prison for premeditated first-degree murder, and also sentenced for assault for both Shannon and Chris, plus 90 years for some of the other charges of aggravated kidnapping and robbery. And with this, Chris's parents were happy to close that chapter on their lives once and for all. This is a closure that we've been looking for. It, it, it never bring Chris back, but it is a closure and maybe we can get our life back and uh, be able to do what we want to do. Our know? children have said, one in particular has said, we'd like to have our parents back. So maybe we can share a few good moments with them and more time and with the grandkids. Mm -hmm. It was enlightening. It was, uh, I, I didn't have all of the uh, tears that she had, but uh, it was uh, very good to hear, to hear me, to hear that. And uh, it, it kind of kept the 12 year effort that we've been battling with since. And uh, I thought it was a good, a good happening. And I can go to my grave now. Satisfied that I fought a good fight. Vanessa is currently at the Tennessee prison for women, and get this, she was up for parole a couple of times over the years. Most recently, Vanessa was up for parole on December 8th, 2020. I didn't speak up, I didn't stand up, and I didn't help when someone needed me the most in their life. And for that, I'm sorry. Shannon's parents urged the seven board members not to let Vanessa out, and her dad even said that he is still grappling with the fact that he will never be able to walk Shannon down the aisle or dance with her at her wedding. 
So all seven members denied Vanessa's parole. But as annoying as it is, she will have another opportunity in December of 2030. Shannon and Chris's families have been left to pick up the pieces over the years, and it hasn't been easy, especially having to go through so many trials and retrials. They have had to go through over 350 court appearances, each time painfully being reminded of the brutal attacks and slayings that their children went through. Now, this case was a rough one to get through, and Chris and Shannon's final moments were nothing short of a pure nightmare, something truly unimaginable that no one should ever have to go through. The fact that Shannon was scrubbed down and forced to drink bleach after going through multiple assaults by multiple people is something that Honestly, I wish I never even had to know. I'm having such a hard time too connecting the dots from the carjacking to all the way to Shannon and Chris being tortured, assaulted, and murdered. Especially being that Chris and Shannon didn't even know any of them and they were literally just minding their own business. So if LaMarcus really just wanted to take their car, why didn't he just take it? And if the group did get spooked, why did Chris and Shannon have to endure the rest of the events that unfolded? Why not just shoot them, kill them, make it quick? Why go to such brutal, savage lengths? I had a hard time finding any real reason as to why LaMarcus and the rest of the group took things as far as they did. Bad childhood or not, the lengths that they all went through to torture Shannon and Chris is something I think only a monster could possibly ever do. I'm curious to know what you think the real reason is why they went as far as they did. I know that this case was a very difficult one and a dark one to hear, so I appreciate you sticking through it and hearing Chris and Shannon's story. It's very important that we continue to give victims their voice and have their stories be heard so that people can be held accountable. It's just awful and brutal what they went through. So thank you for tuning in. All right, guys, until the next episode of Dark Chapters, please stay safe. Bye.